Not every movie needs a ghost or ancient evil running around to be scary. Sometimes the most disturbing thing is Ezra Miller eating fruit, or maybe a not-so-sexy getaway with your emotionally distant husband. Spoilers ahead. Jonathan Glazer's bleak sci-fi horror mashup, Under the Skin, doesn't have much in common with its source material. In the novel, author Michelle Faber paints a cold and cruel Scotland, infiltrated by a strange alien race that is solely interested in breaking humans down into meat, a delicacy on their alien planet. It's a strange, long, and appropriately sad metaphor for factory farming, but the movie version cuts the story down to the bone. In the movie, Scarlett Johansson plays an unnamed woman who drives through Scotland, abducting male hitchhikers and trapping them inside the strange void within her house. No girlfriend, really. No, I don't have a girlfriend at all. Very charming. Those scenes alone are disturbing, as the hitchhikers leer and make moves on Johansson's character, not realizing that they're walking right into her trap. In one particularly disturbing scene, a swimmer on a cold Scottish beach attempts to save a drowning couple as the pair's infant baby watches from the sand. After he fails, Johansson's character attacks him with a rock and drags his body off the beach, leaving the baby to succumb to the elements. She may look like people, but she's totally inhuman. Darren Aronofsky's Requiem for a Dream is a horror movie where addiction is the monster. This unflinchingly bleak portrayal of the different ways in which drug abuse can tear people's lives apart is disturbing not because of violence or gore, but because it's one of the most depressing movies ever made. Why should I even make the bed or wash the dishes? I do them. But why should I? I'm alone. Requiem for a Dream begins with Sarah Goldfarb locking herself in a closet while her heroin-addicted son, Harry, steals her TV to sell for drug money. And this is supposed to be one of the movie's happier points. By the end of the movie, Harry is lying in a hospital bed with his arm amputated, having contracted gangrene from infected injection sites. His friend Tyrone is suffering through withdrawals in jail. Harry's girlfriend, Marion, is performing in degrading sex shows in exchange for her next hit of heroin and Sarah is near catatonic after abusing amphetamines to lose weight for a television appearance that's never going to happen. In conclusion... And uh, as for drugs, well, drugs are bad. You shouldn't do drugs. Okay, that about wraps up my introduction. Now, uh, are there any questions? Gaspar Noé is known for his violent imagery and unsettling premises, but 2018's psychological horror climax ends up subverting the unexpected and the conventional at the same time. The film zeroes in on a stylish and wild French dance troupe who have taken up residency for the night in an abandoned school building, which allows them to get their party on all night long, should they choose to. The rager takes a turn for the worse when the dancers realize their punch bowl has been spiked with LSD. In an effort to figure out the how and why, their night of fun spirals into a horrific and blood-spattered nightmare, which unfolds in the form of little vignettes filled with terror, betrayal, and rampant, unchecked human nature. During one particular scene that will leave you harrowed, an agitated dancer brutalizes her pregnant cohort, whom she doesn't believe is with child. <laughs> the old adage goes that inebriated musings are sober truths, but if it extends to nights like these, we'd rather not know. Eli Roth might not be your favorite horror director, but no one can deny the staying power of his gruesome romp, Cabin Fever. The sexy, bloody, and downright disgusting 2002 film was popular enough to power two sequels and a 2016 remake. While Cabin Fever 2, Spring Fever, and Cabin Fever Patient Zero don't quite capture the magic in the bottle that was the original, the remake sticks close enough to what made the 2002 film work that it feels almost as affecting. Put her there, sport. What's the matter? Cat got your tongue? The plot of both the 2002 and 2016 movies follows a group of conventionally attractive college students as they head into the woods to vacation in a cabin by a lake. They have a week of drinking, smoking, and shenanigans ahead of them, but that dream is quickly cut short when they all begin to develop a mysterious flesh-eating disease. While both films are filled with more scenes of decaying limbs and oozing blood than you could ever want, there's one scene they share in particular that takes the cake. In it, one of the college girls draws a bath in an attempt to clean her bleeding sores. 
When she begins shaving her legs, her skin slides off with the razor, revealing the blood and muscle underneath. It will 100% make you never want to shave again. The difference between a scary movie and a deeply disturbing movie is all in tone, and Hereditary gets you from frame one. Ari Aster's slow push-ins and smooth camera moves underline the horror of Hereditary in much the same way Stanley Kubrick's technique made The Shining the iconic horror film it is. Familial trauma is a common thread in Aster's films, and it's front and center in this story about the shattering of an already fragile family. Tony Collette stars as the matriarch of the house, whose family is targeted by some kind of occult force after the death of her mother. The whole movie is a descent into madness for her character, as she's hit by tragedy after tragedy that culminates in one of the tensest finales of any modern horror film. Stop! Mom, please stop! Mom, I'm sorry, okay, I'm sorry! <laughs> there are precious few jump scares on display. Instead, Aster wants to work his way under the viewer's skin. He'd rather hold on a wide shot and let the audience spot something creepy as hell in the background than have something jump at the lens with a big musical stinger. Alex Wolf and Millie Shapiro are wonderful as brother and sister. Shapiro's Charlie is an odd duck even at the best of times, and her tick, which is a clucking of her tongue, becomes the creepiest movie sound this side of the croaking ghost in Juon, The Grudge. Wolf's character Peter is the central focus of most of the disturbing moments in the movie, which aren't gory or hyper-edited. One scene in particular is simply a long, slow push-in on his face as he's sitting in the driver's seat of a car, trying desperately not to look in the back seat at the headless body of his dead sister. Hereditary is top-tier horror guaranteed to mess up your evening. Horror movies trade in gradual, compounded ignorance of warning signs. Sometimes they'll even warn you in the title, as the 79 disco horror Don't Go in the House suggests. In Lynn Ramsey's slow-burn psych drama We Need to Talk About Kevin, former writer Eva looks back on her life for signs that her son Kevin is a sociopath after he carries out a school massacre. You're my friend. Beat it, Sue. Go give me a soda. Based on the 2003 epistolary novel of the same name by Lionel Shriver, the story disturbs not by its most salacious acts or any sort of gore, quite the opposite. There is a banality to every sign of things to come, and with no accompanying score most of the time, Ramsey draws menace from the silence. Ava has always struggled to connect to Kevin, but when things progress beyond late-stage bedwetting, a layer of dread fills the tonal space where jump scares and boogeymen normally dwell. A devastating climactic reveal that would normally get an orchestral crescendo is only accompanied by the quiet spritz of the lawn sprinkler system. In large part due to Miller's vacant-eyed, intense performance, We Need to Talk About Kevin stays on the mind post-credits not with a scream, but with an insistent whisper. A film about a cult of murderous witches who happen to be mentors at a dance company is sure to spark anyone's interest. But where 2018's Suspiria remake takes things to the next level is in its ability to make that group of murderous witches terrifying, not campy. The film follows a dancer named Susie, who comes to Berlin to audition for a renowned dance company helmed by Madame Blanc. When Susie's cohorts start disappearing, she takes it upon herself to figure out what exactly is going on. This movie banks on the brutality of its antagonists, and if you've seen it, you already know which scene is the best example of this. Remember, you start on one with the music, and if you feel ill at any time, just stop. One of Susie's groupmates accuses the matrons of the company of witchcraft, and she storms out of a rehearsal, only to be trapped in a room where she is unable to stop her body from being crushed and mangled by Susie's powerful performance in the rehearsal above, which appears to be orchestrated by the company's coven. It is hypnotic and nauseating, and you will never look at body horror quite the same way again. Director Jeremy Saulnier's horror thriller, Green Room, is memorable for a few reasons. It is one of Anton Yelchin's final performances before his untimely passing, Sir Patrick Stewart transforms into a murderous neo-Nazi, and it is unquestionably disturbing from the moment the plot kicks off. Centered on a punk band playing a gig at a Nazi club so that they can get gas money to drive home out of desperation, they unwittingly stumble upon a dead body, which leads to some of the most intimate and tense violence of recent memory. Tell me when he's out! Okay! Look at me, look at me, look at me! Shush, shush. 
It's the movie's intimate setting and Saulnier's use of the space that makes the audience feel trapped right along with the band that makes this all so difficult to watch. Several scenes will stick with you long after the house lights go up. A man sticking his arm out of a door only to have it nearly hacked off by a machete is made more disturbing by what we don't see. A dog ripping out a girl's throat and leaving her to gargle on her own blood rather than kill her quickly simply because a later time of death is more convenient for the people who need to cover up these murders. And a girl who was relatively innocent earlier in the day is reduced to cutting a man's stomach open very slowly, top to bottom, with a box cutter. It is all, in a word, brutal. Home invasion horror is nothing new, but director Brian Bertino gave the genre a particularly memorable entry with 2008's The Strangers. She's watching us. She looks like a ghost. Not that killers always need a good reason to do what they do, but at least a little reason helps set up some conflict for the audience. However, this movie becomes so distressing and gut-wrenching toward the end when it's explicitly stated that there's only one reason for Liv Tyler's Kristen and Scott Speedman's James had to suffer through this night of terror. Why are you doing this to us? Because you're a home. While Bertino's slow burn direction and slasher scenes work well, it's that tragic detail that recontextualizes the entire movie for the audience and makes it truly stick. Few movies have ever made the it could happen to you thing stick quite as well. In Gerald's game, Jessie and her husband Gerald plan a sexy weekend getaway as a last ditch attempt at rekindling the fire of their marriage. <laughs> <laughs> wow, baby. You look amazing. The only problem is, Gerald has himself a heart attack while engaging in some serious bondage, leaving Jesse handcuffed to her bed alone with the corpse of her husband and no neighbors within earshot. Can she get herself out of the situation before she dies of dehydration? And is that towering figure she sees in the shadows at night really there, or just a delusion of her perpetually panicked mind? Mike Flanagan's adaptation of what was assumed to be one of Stephen King's most unfilmable stories is a soaring success, thanks in no small part to Carlo Gugino's strong central performance. Getting out of her current situation depends on her confronting some buried trauma from her childhood, which is disturbing in and of itself when shown in flashbacks. I'm sorry you were there when I... It's not like I touched you, Jesse. But when you add in a disfigured apparition that shows up in her room and the climactic, gory solution to get herself out of those handcuffs, you get a movie that manages to get under your skin and stay there. On a deeper emotional level, anytime sexual trauma is tackled in a film, it's going to be difficult for the viewer. So Gerald's Game is a double threat in terms of putting you on edge. It'll hit you emotionally, and then when the big gore moment comes in, you'll be squirming on your couch, daring yourself to look at the screen. The term degloving will forever skeeve you out after watching this movie.